So I was the CEO of a large church planting nonprofit. I was the host of a national television show. I was a speaker at two of the largest mega churches in the US. I was a successful white American male. But the poet and mystic Thomas Merton said, it's a difficult thing to climb to the top of the ladder of success, only to realize when you get there that your ladder has been leaning against the wrong wall. So I knew from the time I was three or four years of age, I was transgender. In my white male privilege, I somehow thought I got to choose my own gender, and that a gender fairy would arrive, and I would say, okay, I want to be a girl, which of course is what I knew myself to be, but alas, no gender fairy arrived, so I just lived my life. I didn't hate being a boy, I just knew I wasn't one. Went to college, got married, had kids, built a career, but the call toward authenticity has all the subtlety of a smoke alarm, and eventually decisions have to be made, and so I came out as transgender and promptly lost every single one of my jobs. I had never had a bad review, but I lost every single job. In all 50 states of the United States, you cannot be fired for being transgender, but you can be fired if you're transgender and you work for a religious corporation. Good to know. This is not true in Europe or in Canada, just in the United States where evangelicalism has so much political power. So just like that, I had lost every single one of my jobs. It's not easy being a transgender woman. People often ask me, do you feel 100% like a woman? And I say, well, first of all, if you talk to one transgender person, you've talked to exactly one transgender person. I, I'm not going to try to speak for anybody else. I feel 100% like a transgender woman because there are a whole lot of things a cisgender woman knows that I will never, ever know. That said, I'm learning a lot about what it means to be a woman, and I'm learning a lot about my former gender. And I'm here to tell you the differences are massive. I always like to start with a little stuff, like the pockets on women's jeans. I've been working on this one for eight years now, Still, no one can explain this to me. I mean, they're utterly useless. I bought a pair of jeggings. Jeggings have stitching here that makes you think there's a pocket, but oh no, there's no pocket there. So I do a lot of corporate speaking on gender equity issues. And last year, I got to speak at the Levi's Corporation at their headquarters in San Francisco, 500 people. I thought, now I will find out about the pockets on the jeans. No. No, they're like, yep, they're barely there at all. Yeah, you, I already knew that. Don't get that. Or, or the size of a woman's wardrobe. As a guy, I had a couple of pairs of jeans, a couple of pairs of khakis, a blue sport coat. Really, as a guy, what else do you need? But as a woman, I have closets and closets full of clothes because you can't wear something very often or people notice. Actually, Men don't notice, but women will notice, and they will judge you for it. Here's a phrase you will never, ever hear spoken to a man. Never. You will never hear anyone say to a man, oh, that's not a good haircut for a man over 50. You will not hear that because we don't care if a man looks like he's over 50 or 60 or 70 for that matter, but a woman, people say to me, Who's your hairdresser? As if to say, do you really even have a hairdresser? And if you do, does she know you're over 50? So I was working on our church chapel, redecorating it, really kind of rebuilding the whole thing with one of my co-pastors. And so I walked in with a pair of jeans on and a rugby shirt that was tucked in. And as soon as I walked in the room, she said, should you really tuck in that shirt? No one ever said to me as a man, should you really tuck in that shirt? Though you probably have noticed, there are a number of times when you wish someone had said to a man, should you really tuck in that shirt? 
You know, there's no way a well-educated white male can understand how much the culture is tilted in his favor. It's all he's ever known. It did not take me long to discover the other side of that. The very first time I ever flew as Paula, I was flying from Denver to Charlotte, and I got on the plane, and there was stuff in my seat. So I picked the stuff up, and I put my stuff down, and a guy said, that's my stuff. And I said, well, OK, but it's in my seat. So I'll be happy to hold your stuff for you till you find your seat. And he said, lady, that is my seat. I said, yeah, actually, it's not. It's my seat, 1D. But like I said, I'll be happy to hold your stuff until you find your seat. He said, I do not know what I need to tell you, lady. That is my seat. I said, it's not. It's my seat, 1D. At which point, the guy behind me said, lady, would you take your effing argument elsewhere so I can get in the plane? I was stunned. I had never been treated like that as a man. I can tell you exactly what would have happened. I would have said, excuse me, I believe that's my seat. Immediately, the guy would have looked at his boarding pass because he would have assumed I knew what I was talking about. He would have seen that I was right, and he would have said, excuse me, and would have moved his stuff. I know that because it happened scores of times. But no, because I'm a woman, I can't possibly know what seat I might be sitting in. So the flight attendant has to take our boarding passes, says to the guy, sir, you're in 1C. She's in 1D. I put his stuff down in 1C. No, I'm sorry. No, thank you. No, nothing. I sit down in my seat, 1D. And you know who's next to be in 1F. It's Mr. Would you take your effing argument elsewhere? And so my friend Karen, who works for American at Denver, comes onto the plane, gives the paperwork to the captain. She leaves, waves goodbye. I get to Charlotte. She called me. She said, Paula, what happened? I told her, and she said, oh, oh, yeah, welcome to the world of women. Now, here's the truth. I will not live long enough to lose my male privilege. I brought it with me when I transitioned. I had a lot of decades as a man. But that doesn't mean I do not see my power diminishing. And this one's frustrating. One of the places I see it diminishing the most is in liberal Christianity. So I am on the board of a large Christian, liberal, nonprofit. You know about it. We have a large national conference. A lot of you attend it. So we were having a board meeting. We had a brand new CEO. And we were talking about having the new CEO speak for the conference. And I said, well, she's not a seasoned speaker. Maybe it would be better if we just interviewed her. But, you know, if you want her to speak, I'll be happy to coach her. At which point, a very powerful white gay man in the room said, well, if we're going to do that, why don't we hire a real coach? I've done four TED Talks. Four. I'm a speaker's ambassador for TED, which means I work with TED speakers from all over the world. Last year, I worked with one of the astronauts currently on the space station. It's a nice gig to be able to be a speaker's ambassador for TED speakers. I've coached TEDx speakers. I've taught speech in three universities, two in the United States, one in Europe. Tell me what part of that does not make me a real coach. But of course, I didn't say anything, because if I said something, now I'm just that woman. And of course, it's way, way worse in the evangelical world. I was well known in my denomination, the independent Christian churches. We had about 6,000 churches nationwide. I probably knew five to 6,000 people by name. I transitioned eight years ago. So you know how many of those five to 6,000 people I've talked with in any kind of substantive conversation since then? Three. Exactly three of five or 6,000. So how many of my non-evangelical friends did I lose when I transitioned? Zero. I'm a pastoral counselor by profession. That's what my doctorate is in. How many of my clients did I lose when I transitioned? Zero. But five to 6,000 evangelical friends, you know, you can make of that what you like. 
Do you know that right now, 17 laws have been passed in seven states taking away the civil rights of transgender children? Either not allowing those children to play sports in the gender with which they identify, or far worse, like in Arkansas, stopping them from getting medical care related to their gender dysphoria. There are 250 more laws pending in another 30 states. Who's driving these laws? You say, well, it's Republicans. Actually, it's not. 66% of Republicans believe that transgender children should be able to play sports according to the gender with which they identify. Interesting. So it must be political conservatives. It must be other Trump voters, right? So NPR and Marist did a study on election day in the 10 swing states of only Trump voters, and they discovered 61% of Trump voters in the swing states believe transgender people should have the same civil rights as everyone else. So where is the opposition coming from? 84%, 84% of evangelicals believe gender is immutably determined at birth. 61% of them believe we already have provided far too many civil rights to transgender people, and yet only 25% of them know someone who's out as a transgender person. And who are they attacking more than anyone else right now? It's transgender children who are at 13 times higher risk of suicide than anyone else, but nobody wants to name it what it is. Just a few weeks ago, I was doing a White House event with Pete Buttigieg and H Rachel Levine. And I was going to talk about this 84% number. And Josh Dixon, who's head of faith-based initiatives, is a good friend of mine, and he was good with it. But when it got time for the program to begin, he said, oh, higher-ups have said you're not allowed to say anything negative about evangelicals because we don't want to lose their attention. He said, it might be a little bit late for that. <laughs> That's where the opposition to transgender children is coming from. And of course, it's far worse when you look at just the issue of gender equity. My first TED talk on gender equity has had over four and a half million views. And so I get to speak all over the world on gender equity. I've got a unique perspective. I know what it's like having lived on both sides. And so I speak all over the place, Asia, Europe, the United States, Canada, Mexico. It, it's really enjoyable. It's a nice living. But I discover different responses in different parts of the world. If I'm speaking in Scandinavia or Northern Europe, I find gender equity is pretty much well on the way there. If it's Southern Europe, eh, not so much. If it's most of the rest of Western Europe, yeah, they're doing well. If it's the East or West Coast of the United States, a lot of gender equity, but not so much in other parts of the US. I was speaking for a company just two weeks ago it's an international company, 10,000 employees, architectural and engineering firm, but it's based in a southern state that I shall allow to remain nameless. There are 1,000 employees at the headquarters of that company in that southern city. So I was talking to their chief people officer before I spoke, and he said, our corp corporate culture, as any corporate culture, is established by our main office and it's extremely not focused on gender equity. I said, do you know why? And he said, I hate to say this, but it's because of the influence of evangelical Christianity on a lot of the people in our C-suite. They don't think there's a problem. I said, actually, you're correct. Because in 30 states of the United States, the major religious teaching is that men are supposed to be in charge of women at home, at church, and by extrapolation in every other part of society. People on the coasts don't understand that kind of teaching permeates in the middle of our nation. So they don't realize the issues we have related to gender equity. I was an evangelical male leader. And I wish I could go back and say a few things to Paul. I would love it if I could go back and speak to myself. I mean, the first thing I would say, and this, guys, please, this more than anything else, this. 
assume a woman knows what she's talking about and treat her accordingly. Just that, all by itself, will make a huge difference. Well, that and stop interrupting us. Because did you know men interrupt women twice as often as they interrupt other men? I wish I could go back and say to Paul, yeah, just assume that a woman knows what she's talking about and treat her accordingly. I also wish I could go back to Paul and explain the importance of deference. Because I don't think when I was a man, I even knew what deference was. Somehow it's something that women must do. I had no idea that deference means actually stepping away from your position of power and handing it willingly to someone else. A marvelous concept. Women learn it as a birthright. Men see it as a weakness. Till men can understand deference is a strength we're never going to achieve gender equity. And it begins by being an ally. By saying, I'm with you, I'm standing beside the women, no matter what, I am with you. But that's not deference. Deference is when you move from being an ally to an accomplice or an apprentice. When you move to the point where you're saying to the women in your world, you tell me what I need to do and I will do it. That means giving up some power. I wish I had learned the value of deference. I wish I could go back and say to Paul, you got to learn to listen better. So I was talking to my former executive assistant not long ago. She worked with me for 20 years, and she said, you know, you really were pretty good at championing the causes of women. We were happy about it, but she said, one thing you did that was very male, we would ask you a question, and you would give us an absolutely articulate, wonderful answer to the question we were not asking. Because you had never listened to our question through to the end, you were just too proud of yourself that you were the answer provider. You know, I wish I had learned to truly listen. I am a pastoral counselor by trade, and I work from what's called a person-centered perspective, which says that I, as the therapist, do not have any answers. My client has the answers. And my job as a therapist is to help them remove the obstacles that are stopping them from getting to their own answers. That's my job. You can't do that if you're not listening. So I have a client right now who knew me when I was Paul and just finished my book not long ago. I'm not sure how I feel about clients reading a memoir. But just finished my book. And he wrote me a note last week and he said, I just want to let you know I'm not sure I ever would have come to Paul for therapy. Paula knows things Paul never would have known. And I find you to be a very good listener. Yeah, it took me too long to learn that message. A fourth thing I wish I could go back and tell Paul is don't be defensive when a woman tells you you need to change your ways. Men too often are defensive or they react by attacking you instead. Seems like we possibly recently had a president who was adept at that. <laughs> what I wish I could say to Paul is, you know, when, when a woman tells you something you need to know that's difficult to accept, don't respond. Sleep on it. Because until you sleep on it, it's not going to get beneath your ego level to get to the level of your soul. And when things stop at the ego level, we will never take them in. We will always be defending ourselves. Sleep on it. Let it drop to the level of your soul and then decide whether or not the person knows what they're talking about with what they have said to you. I wish that I could take in that kind of information more. And the last thing I wish I could say to Paul, well, not last thing, but the last I'm going to talk about today. I wish I could go back to Paul and say, oh, you need to lose more often. You need to fail more often. Men think they're not allowed to fail, and because we're handed so much in life, we don't even realize we start life way closer to the finish line than anybody else, and so everything we touch turns to gold, and we think that's a marvelous thing because we are incredibly skilled. Until you fail, you have no idea who you are. I mean Jacob wrestling with God kind of failure. I mean Rilke's poem, The Man Watching, the end of that poem, 
Winning does not tempt that man. This is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. That kind of failure. Failure that causes you to be utterly and completely lost. Failure that causes you to realize, oh, lost is a place too. And there are things I can learn in the place called lost. I could not learn any other way. I wish I had been willing to sit through failure, to be in that dark night of the soul. I had no idea the lessons I needed to learn. And I see the women out there saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the guys, you guys need to hear all this stuff. Well, I'm sorry, but ladies, there are some things I wish I could say to you too. Well, in fact, not only do I wish I could say them, I will say them. The first, and this one is shocking to me, women do not empower one another. Men do. Men come into a room. The first thing they do is determine who the alpha is in the room. Then they rank themselves according to the alpha generously, and then they set about accomplishing the purposes of the alpha. Or to use a sports analogy, they get in a huddle, slap each other on the butt, and then advance the quarterback and the ball down the field. That's what men do. They empower one another. Women do not. Women see each other as competition. I think I know why. Did you know the average white woman in America earns 81 cents on the dollar of what the average white man earns? African American woman, 64 cents on the dollar. Native American woman, 59 cents on the dollar. Hispanic American woman, 54 cents on the dollar. 5.8% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. 22% of senior executive vice presidents are women. 6.6% of Silicon Valley CEOs are women. 2% of directors, 11% of writers, 19% of producers, 20% of lead actors are women. 3% of venture capital goes to female founded firms. Interestingly, 47% of first and second year law associates are women but only 15% make partner. And the worst statistic of all, did you know that mothers with children at home are 44% less likely to be hired for a job than anybody else? Even though they are proven to be excellent multitaskers, take fewer unnecessary risks, and focus on return on investment like nobody else. I don't understand why women do not empower one another. So I was interviewed for, I have a book out, um, uh, As a Woman, What I Learned About Power, Sex, and the Patriarchy After I Transitioned. It was published by Simon & Schuster back in June. I've had wonderful publicity related to that. I'll, I'll actually be signing uh, uh, books for those of you who, who pick them up um, right after the session, I think. But I was being interviewed by K.K. Otteson for the Washington Post, which is quite an honor. She is both a a photographer and a reporter there, and she does features in the magazine every week. And so I was talking with her about the fact that women don't empower one another, and she said, oh, actually, my experience is that they do. And I said, okay, well, my experience is not. So the next day, we're talking again, and she said, oh, yesterday I was talking to Madeleine Albright, as one does, and she said, <laughs> And she said, we were talking about this, and she said, don't, don't you remember when I've always said there's a special place in hell reserved for women who do not empower one another? We're never going to achieve gender equity unless women start empowering one another. A second thing, a second thing I'd love to say to the women I work with is learn to say, I've got this. We teach our sons to be confident. We teach our daughters to be perfect. We say it's going to be harder for you, so you've got to be perfect. Things go well. They finish high school, top in their class, college, top in their class. Now they've got a job in the corporate world. A position opens up in the company. It has five requirements. A woman has four of the five, and she thinks, oh, no, there's no way I can apply for this job because I don't have the fifth, because I'm not perfect. A guy has two of the five, and because we've taught our sons to be confident, he says, I got this. He applies for the job. He gets the job, even though he's exactly half as qualified as a woman who would not even apply. We've got to stop teaching our daughters to be perfect and teach them instead to be persistent. 
Another thing I want to say to all the women that I work with, own what you know. I was an alpha male. You might be surprised to know this, but the world does not respond negatively to alpha males. Alpha females? Oh, well, let me ask you a question. What do Norway, Finland, Iceland, Germany, Taiwan, and New Zealand have in common? All five did extremely well through the first, second, third phases of the coronavirus. All five have a, a female head of state. Do you know what we see with women who are alpha leaders? Henry Nouwen always said, the greatest leaders on earth have equal parts confidence and humility, paradoxical strengths. Do you know that we see that far more often with alpha, or if you don't like the term alpha, agentic females than we do with males? You look at all six of those women, they all have great confidence coupled with great humility. Own what you know. A fifth thing I'd like to say to the women is be ambitious. Because we don't teach our daughters to be ambitious, we teach them to acquiesce. It's all right to be ambitious. I loved my Kentucky farmer grandmother dearly, but I remember distinctly being at her farmhouse in eastern Kentucky and there being one biscuit left on the plate. And my cousin Jane, who was three years older than me, reached out for the biscuit, and Grandma said, oh, Jane, don't take that. Paul needs it. He's a growing boy. Well, Jane might possibly have been a growing girl. Boys are taught from a young age, be ambitious, go ahead, take the last biscuit. Girls are taught to acquiesce. And the last thing I would say to the women is, please yourself first. Women are taught to feel guilty if they've taken care of their own needs before someone else's. This is taught from very early in life. It's a false guilt. You might make a boundary, but then you spend the rest of the day feeling badly about the boundary you just made. Take care of your own needs first. Please yourself. So I'm a pastor, one of four co-equal co-pastors at Left Hand Church in Boulder County, Colorado. One of my pastors is a white male. My other two pastors are females. So the guy and I do most of the preaching, but we're adding another of our co-pastors who's got such a pastor's heart into the preaching schedule. And when I first talked to her about preaching, she's like, I can't do this, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I don't have the ability. And I said, oh, you have no idea how much our people are going to love your preaching because you have a perspective John doesn't have, and I live in the borderlands between genders. I come from that liminal space. I, I don't have the same experience you have. I said, our people are going to respond amazingly to you. She was terrified. And then she preached. Our people went crazy because of the heart that came through. So she preached again just, um, just five weeks ago, this coming Sunday. And I happened to be in the coast of New Hampshire. And so the whole time she was preaching, I was praying for her. But then when I got back where I had internet, I watched the service. We have a big online audience. It's Left Hand Church. You can find us at Facebook every Sunday at 5, Mountain Time. But we have a big online audience, and I watched, I watched the sermon. It was wonderful. And as I watched it, a poem came to mind. I have like 25 poems memorized, and I find it instructive when they come to mind. This one rarely comes to mind, so much so that I often don't remember the words. It's a David White poem. But it came to me while I watched her preach. It's called The Soul Lives Contented. The soul lives contented by listening. 
If the soul wants to change into the beauty of terrifying shapes, it tries to speak. The soul lives contented by listening. But if it wants to change into the beauty of terrifying shapes, it tries to speak. But that's why you will not sing. That's why you will not sing. That's why you will not sing. Frightened you are as who might or might not join with you. Your voice hesitant. The soul's hand reaching in the dark for yours. She touches your face and says your name in the same instant. It's the name you refuse to say. It's the name you refuse to say one more time. The soul lives contented by listening. If it wants to change into the beauty of terrifying shapes, it tries to speak. Ah, but that's why you will not sing, frightened as you are, of who might or might not join with you, your voice hesitant, her hand reaching in the dark for yours. She touches your face and says your name in the same instant. It's the name you refused to say. Over and over, it's the name you refused to say. Thank you.